This discussion is going to focus on the renal and urogenital system. So in looking at the renal and urogenital system, again, you're looking at the components here, the, the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. So the whole purpose of this portion of the system is to filter blood, regulate fluid levels, and help to eliminate waste. So that the kidneys are gonna be responsible for helping to remove waste products and excessive water. And then we'll talk about you know, the other components and how they operate. And this, what's essentially gonna get produced is urine. And urine is a substance that contains water, protein, metabolism, byproducts, and salt. Um, you could also find small amounts of glucose, crystallized salts, and mucus. Again, there's other things that it shouldn't contain. In particular, there shouldn't be any blood cells or whole proteins. Um, obviously, you wouldn't have large amounts of sugar in the, or large amounts of glucose in the urine, because that would also um, indicate that there is a, that there's an issue going on. Um, and again, th this system is going to contribute to homeostasis. So there's hormonal and osmotic balance through the fluid regulation that it, ha it has to occur. Also, the, the kidneys help to regulate red blood cell production and also help to regulate calcium levels. So when we look at the kidney, the, the basic functioning unit of the kidney is what's called the nephron. So if you look here on this picture, you can kind of see they kind of tease out a nephron. So we talk about how the, the kidneys are responsible for filtering blood and then to helping eliminate waste products and excessive water. So you kind of see um, the unfiltered blood coming into the nephron, um, the filtered blood coming out, and then obviously the, the, the helping to produce the urine, which you know eventually if you look at all these individual nephrons, it kind of empties out and the, the urine comes out here um, looking at the looking at the kidney. So again, the, the nephrons, the functional unit, again has a role in um, promoting homeostasis. So again, you can have um, pathological situations as far as the the kidneys are concerned. So if there's either increased fluid absorptions or maybe substances aren't taken out of the blood that should be or processed for elimination, that would start to tell you that there's uh, a possible issue with the kidneys. And again, through homeostasis, the kidneys also help to regulate blood pressure. Again, I, I mentioned before about the red blood cell production and regulating calcium levels. Uh, we're also gonna be talking about the genital and reproductive system. So uh, the, the testes and their, and their role in producing testosterone, the ovaries and with estrogen, and again, the whole purpose here is to, again, inducing puberty in the, the, the developing child, regulate sexual uh, health and function. So we'll talk about um, some of the, the reproductive mechanisms uh, here as well. Um, just going back up to the kidneys, again, if there's any damage to the kidneys, that does affect their ability to filter. So there could be a buildup of metabolic by, byproducts. And that could also kind of indirectly cause changes to the, to the cardiovascular and neurological system. So there's a tie-in with those, those other two systems as well. So I mentioned earlier about the regulation of blood pressure, and there's two ways that the kidneys help in doing this. One is through the secretion of renin. So renin will basically cause, uh, that will, will basically increase vascular resistance because it causes vasoconstriction. So that helps to raise blood pressure. The other way is through elimination of excessive fluid, which would cause a decrease in blood pressure. Um, if for some reason that the kidneys cannot excrete excessive fluid, that can cause an increase in, in blood pressure. So when an individual is hypertension, there can be two different mechanisms for that. One would be um, either increased renin or there would be a situation where there'd be hyper hypervolemia or an increase or an excessive amount of fluid present in the circulation. Um, in either instance, the this can cause damage to the nephron. So one of the you know one of the fears with someone who has hypertension, in addition to other areas that can be damaged or there could be issues with one of those is the, the added stress that can be placed on the, um, on the kidneys, particularly to, the, uh, to that functional unit, the nephron. So a couple other things regarding anatomy and physiology, if we look at um, just a response to exercise with blood pressure. So obviously with resistance training, um, systolic and diastolic blood pressure is going to increase in proportion to the exercise load. So typically with, with heavier resistance, you're going to see the blood pressure go up. 
So there is some precautions for individuals who have cardiovascular or kidney issues um, as far as resistance training to make sure that either they don't resistance train heavier, if it's severe, not to resistance train at all. With aerobic exercise, um, systolic blood pressure does go up initially, um, but then it kind of levels off and it decreases back to normal as exercise continues, and diastolic really doesn't change much at all. So from the standpoint of, an, of, of more aerobic exercise, there's, there's benefit to um, individuals that have hypertension. When we look at the reproductive system and we look at the menstrual cycle in females, again, this is going to be modified by hormones coming from the hypothalamus. And in particular, your, your estrogen and progesterone are going to regulate the production of ovulation and the endometrial development. So um, this would be in the presence of ovulation and your endometrial development usually happens two weeks before menses. And then in the case where um, if, if pregnancy doesn't occur and the levels decrease, the endometrium gets expelled and then the cycle will, will, will start all over again. Um, we'll make note about menstrual dysfunctions later on, but just to make a note now about amenorrhea, which is the absence of menstruation, uh, this is broken down into both primary and secondary amenorrhea. So primary amenorrhea is when the first menses fails to occur by age of 16. Um, and again, this can occur for various reasons. Um, if, the, if the patient has already, or the, if the individual has already had their first menstrual cycle, secondary amenorrhea is when an individual has fewer than three cycles per year or lack of menstruation for three consecutive months. And again, this could be due to various reasons. It could actually be due, obviously, to pregnancy, um, but it could also be due to endocrine disorders and, and, and malnutrition as well. Uh, the musculoskeletal component to this region, again, we look at the, the muscles, uh, particularly of the pelvis, to help promote uh, normal function of the organs in the pelvis. And just, again, the musculoskeletal component obviously helps to provide support to the organs in the region. So here you have the, the renal urogenital system uh, for the male and including the reproductive organs. So you see the, the kidneys here. Again, the kidneys are going to empty into the are going to empty urine into the ureters, which is then uh, distributed to the bladder. The bladder then holds the urine, and then from there the um, the urethra then takes the urine through for for elimination. Here you can also see the the prostate gland, um, the testes, the epididymis, which would be a part of the the male reproductive system. And then here you have the, the same for the female. Again, kidneys through the ureters as far as to the elimination of, of urine. And you can see the, the fallopian tubes, uh, uterus uh, for the reproductive organs of the female. Okay, looking at your signs and symptoms, so hematuria and dysuria, and there is an algorithm that kind of goes through kind of how to manage it based upon their their signs and symptoms and, and what your referral should be. So hematuria is blood in the urine, and this could either be a gross or a subtle hematuria. So if it's a gross hematuria, you could actually see the blood in the urine. If it's a more subtle one, it may take a urinalysis to see it. There is also something called sports hematuria, which basically occurs from either like an exercise-induced is exercise-induced ischemia due to like a long duration, high intensity exercise, or just repetitive trauma to the kidneys or bladder. You see this a lot in runners just from the actual like, um, I guess kind of almost like bouncing that occurs with, uh, with running, you can get this. And, and really from the standpoint of um, a sports hematuria, they kind of just recommend a little bit of rest and then they can kind of get back to activity within, within 24 hours. There's all different types of changes in urinary habits. So again, dysuria is just difficult urination. Nocturia is just waking up, you know, from sleep to urinate. There's unusual urgency where all of a sudden people will just have to suddenly go. Um, incontinence is just the inability to control the excretion. Um, oliguria is a very infrequent urination. And then anuria is absence of urination. So all of these things would be um, indicative of various disorders, um, oliguria and anuria. Again, there could be symptoms, it could be symptoms related to the renal system, um, just the urinary tract in general, or it could be because of a metabolic disorder. Uh, we had mentioned amenorrhea with the menstrual irregularities already, but there's others as well. So oligomenorrhea is when there's only three to six cycles per year, and they tend to be very long. 
dysmenorrhea is when you have that really significant pain associated with it. And we know the, um, the premenstrual uh, syndrome, which again is just, which is typically what you would get. Um, again, some of the discomfort associated with that. Hypertension is another thing you would want to note, again, because of the connection with the, the kidneys. If for some reason somebody does have hypertension, um, number one, you'd always be concerned about um, possible issues, obviously, related to the kidneys as far as kidney damage. But you can also look at that as a source for the hypertension. Um, anemia would be another thing. Again, erythropoietin is a, a hormone that gets secreted by the kidneys to um, regulate red blood cell production. So if there's a kidney pathology that affects the production of that hormone, that could reduce your, your red blood cells. Nipple discharge, because um, again, we're just looking at the, um, the, the reproductive system. So if there's a serous or sanguinous, which would be a bloody discharge, or a serosanguinous, which is a mix of bloody and, and fluid, um, with like a lot of your like breast conditions, particularly breast cancer, that would be a concern. But there's more benign breast conditions where that could occur. You could have a gland infection and even hormonal imbalances could cause that. Um, any type of, of sexual dysfunction in general, um, you know, blood in the semen, unusual vaginal bleeding, loss of libido would all be things to be concerned about. So your pain patterns, um, again, we look at the kidneys, the ureters and the bladders. So the kidneys usually refer pain to the low back and abdomen. Um, kidney stones produce like acute, like an intermittent pain in the abdomen and low back, and it could actually kind of radiate to the ipsilateral lower abdominal quadrant where it's present. Um, the groin and perineum could also be areas where the kidneys uh, refer pain to. The ureters could refer, refer pain to the groin, thigh, and abdomen, and the bladders usually you look at the suprapubic region, the low back, and the thighs. Um, we look at some of the, the reproductive organs for the males. Um, you know, for instance, if there's testicular trauma and just or, or anything where the testes would, would cause pain, the lower abdomen and sacrum um, could be areas where there would be pain with that. The prostate can actually um, cause pain in both the back, the scrotal region, and the perineum. Um, it's important to note that if, if a male does take trauma to the, to the testes and they have pain that lasts longer than 10 minutes, uh, that could be indicative of a more serious issue. You could have a testicular torsion, so that would be an important thing to note. Um, for females, um, again, when you look at the, the ovaries and fallopian tubes, uh, they tend to refer a lot of pain to the lower abdomen and into the sacrum. So when we look at the, the physical exam, Again, your history, you know, get a history, you know, have there been any STDs? Is there a family history of kidney stones, diabetes, hypertension, um, sickle cell disease? Has the person had any exposure to toxins and heavy metals that could cause a lot of damage to the kidneys? You know, ask about, you know, for females, ask about contraceptive use, you know, ask if, uh, you know, anti-inflammatories or any type of medications. Um, you could also ask patients about the absence of the kidney, testicle or ovary. Um, you know, ask, you know, females what their menstrual history is, any, any incidences of, of masses in their breasts. From the inspection standpoint, um, you could look at, if, are there any edemas? Is there, is there any edema in the extremities? That's usually indicative of some, like, late kidney dysfunction. Um, you don't see that, uh, you know, you don't really see a whole lot with inspection with most urogenital problems, but that would be something if someone has kidney dysfunction, you would see. Um, some edema starting to form just because of the fluid buildup. Uh, from a palpation standpoint, you could kind of see here, uh, obviously the right kidney sits a little lower than the left um, anatomically, and you could kind of see how at the, the coastal vertebral angle, how the bottom portion of the kidneys are kind of exposed there, particularly the right kidney. So if you look at the 12th rib, um, that's your coastal vertebral angle, you can kind of see there. Again, any tenderness around there would be abnormal. You could do also a little percussion or hammering, um, as they call it, over the region, which is just some like light striking to see if there's any pain associated with that. Um, if there's any type of, if there is any type of genital injuries, uh, obviously do your, your history and get a symptoms. Um, and individuals could kind of perform a self-examination with that as well. So, you know, if you have a, you know, for instance, a male athlete and they, they, they took trauma to the, to the, uh, to the genitals, 
you know, they could also do a self exam and make sure that, you know, they could kind of get an idea to feel if there's, there's any issues um, related to like, say for instance, a testicular torsion. So your analysis is one of the more common things that you can do. It's pretty simple. It could kind of give you an idea as far as, you know, again, with the, you know, the kidneys, the urinary tract to see if, if everything, see how everything's functioning. It kind of gives you a good overall view. Um, one thing you could do is measure specific gravity. So what that looks at is the concentrations of solutes um, within the urine, and that would obviously increase with dehydration, and that could be caused by decreased um, levels of, of fluid intake. Um, you see down on the bottom picture is the spectrometer. They also use that to, to determine the uh, specific gravity. With your urinalysis dipstick, you can take the pH. So again, the pH will kind of look at is the urine more alkaline or is it more, um, is it more acidic? So urine pH ranges from 4.5 to 8, with 7 being considered neutral. If the pH is greater than 7, it's the pH is considered alkaline. If it's lower than seven, it's considered a little bit more acidic. And there's different reasons as to what would make the urine more alkaline versus more acidic. So, um, you know, a more, a more alkaline urine, you usually look at like a urinary tract obstruction, hyperventilation, chronic renal failure, or aspirin intoxication with acidic urine. You look at acidosis, uncontrolled diabetes, dehydration, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, which would which would cause the dehydration as well. Leukocytes, if there's leukocytes, uh, the presence of white blood cells in the urine, that would that would indicate possible infection. Uh, with proteins, um, the presence of greater than trace amounts of protein is associated with kidney disease. So you might see small amounts of protein um, as indicated by this, but there shouldn't be large or whole, large amount or whole proteins present. Uh, glucose. So this would be excessive. This, this would be associated with excessive glucose in the blood or hyperglycemia. So again, there would be concern there, particularly for individuals with um, with diabetes. Ketones are byproducts of fat metabolism, and they could be um, related to someone suffering from a, a diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, someone who's on some form of dysfunctional or disordered eating. So someone who's anorexic, someone who's had excessive vomiting people who are on high protein, low carbohydrate diets tend to have a lot of ketones in their, their urine as well. Um, so if you have ketones present in a patient with diabetes, that usually warrants the injection of, of insulin. So if you could test them for ketones, that would tell you if they need an insulin injection. Uh, if there's blood, so greater than trace amounts of blood, you worry about kidney or bladder injury. Uh, nitrite is positive for the presence of, of if an individual has bacteria present in their urine. Uh, urobilogen, um, there's normal values for this. They range about zero to eight milligrams per deciliter. There's increased amounts that usually suggest a liver pathology. So whether it be an infection or cirrhosis, um, if the values are, are very low, it could suggest blockage of the bile passage or decrease in bile production. And bilirubin is, that, is the yellow pigment that's found in the bile that we had talked about previously. And again, this could be indicative of either a liver or gallbladder pathology. And as I said, I, I mentioned at the beginning of this. So again, this is your your urinalysis for the dipstick. So you you know again, there's a um, uh, and, and there's a certain way you're supposed to do the urine collection to make sure that it's a a, a clean um, urine catch to make sure that it's accurate. Um, this is what's called a, a refractometer, and this is actually a little bit more, a more accurate way to measure specific gravity or determining the level of hydration, um, and that, that's, this is more accurate than, than actually using the, uh, the chem strip for that purpose.